Hi there and welcome to the Blogger's Guide to Cruising. I'm Julie Peasgood and today I'm delving into the exciting life of a man who first stepped on board a cruise back in 1981. In the 35 years since then, he's sampled everything from small and intimate to big and mega. Whether it's ocean or river, luxury or mainstream, Anthony Nicholas is quite simply an expert when it comes to cruising. Anthony, it's a pleasure to have you with us. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for asking me. <laughs> now, I know you also write about maritime history, hotels, rail journeys. What is it, though, about cruising that really captivates you? It's the whole idea of this ship being an enchanted little world of its own that sort of gets you out there. It takes you out into the world. It takes you out of yourself. And it shuttles you round this sort of conga line of fabulous different places, <laughs> you know, that you might never have thought of going to. Conga line, I love that. <laughs> I, I don't know, it's, it's kind of like what I call kid on Christmas day syndrome. Mm -hmm. You know, starting every new cruise is like being that little kid again. And you're unwrapping all your Christmas presents and you've got that same sort of childish sense of delight. You know, at the start of every one. This is fantastic. It, it's a ballpark figure, unless you know a specific figure. How many cruises have you been on in 35 years? Oh, law. It's over 160. And you still have that wonderful sense of excitement and enthusiasm. That is probably what makes you such a good writer, because you're never jaded. No. I mean, up to now, so far, I've never been jaded. And to be, to be honest with you, Julie, if it ever got to the stage where I thought I was, then I think, yeah, I would probably pack it in. But, mm. you know, thank God so far, no jaded. <laughs> OK, what was that first cruise back in, uh, back in 1981? Oh, the Norway. Uh, it was an old transatlantic liner originally called the SS France. It was a ship that you used to get people like Bert Lancaster, Audrey Hepburn, Salvador Dali on travelling on. I mean, Dali used to walk his pet ocelots on deck. What? You know, his he pet walked leopards. his pet he ocelots? His pet, he used to walk his pet ocelots on deck. They were allowed on a cruise ship leopards? Well, he was Salvador Dali. So I guess he got to take his own ocelots. Um, that, ship, that ship had people like David Bowie on board, you know, when really Bowie was at the height of his pomp. And what happened was the French couldn't afford to run the ship anymore in the 70s, so they took her out of service. Six years later, she came back massively refurbished as a cruise ship called the Norway. At the time, she was the biggest and, you know, the most spectacular that the industry had ever seen. And uber luxurious, mind. presumably. Oh, yeah, she was total art deco from bow to stern. You expect her to turn a corner and see Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers appear <laughs> and just start dancing. It was like it was like Hollywood's idea of what an ocean liner would look like. Everything was sort of potted palms, marble, brass, you know, sweeping staircases. Tinkling ivories everywhere oh, you went. Oh, tinkling ivories, absolutely. You've got to have tinkling ivories. They had a 15-piece big band on that ship. You know, big ship, big band. You know, it's just seamless, it seems to be. It should be the perfect fit, and on the Norway it was. And I just decided that I had to go on that ship. I just decided there and then that no matter, you know, 22 year old, and I'd never even been on a plane before at that stage. And I thought, if you're gonna do one thing in your life that really sort of stands out, you know, that is exceptional, you gotta go and go, you gotta go and you gotta go on this ship. So did you pay for your, or did you have a writing commission? No, 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 I wasn't even writing then. I worked an average 80 hour week uh, for 13 months to put the money together to do it. I went out to Miami in November 1981, uh, picked the Norway up, did a week in the Caribbean and nothing was ever the same after that. Oh. Nothing was ever going to be the same after that. OK, so you started at the top, but presumably it's not been downhill all the way since, obviously. But when was the moment where you thought, I love this life and I've got to translate it into earning a living? Because I can't just keep shelling on out for wonderful mm. Norways. I'm going to write about them. When was that moment? I think if there's a conscious moment, you could say that happened 
it would have been about the third or fourth time I got off the QE2. <laughs> um, I used to, I got into a, a habit of crossing the Atlantic on the ship once or twice a year. Either having a few days in New York first and then coming home on the Queen or going over and having a few days in New York and then flying home. And that got to be a ritual. And it was just something I fell into. It was like Alice through the looking glass. You know, you get into a comfort zone. And that's essentially what it was. And I thought somewhere down the line, you know, you're doing something right. It feels right. Yeah. How do you actually translate this into, you know, a career and possibly a future? Yeah. That was when, if you want, the light bulb came on, uh -huh. for want of a better word. And I thought, yeah, I need to do more of this. Great. And did you, did you find that, that the writing, I, I don't know if you'd had a history before that of writing, but did you just, presumably, you're a man who speaks from your heart. Mm -hmm. So um, you write from your heart. I write the way I talk. Um, I don't try and be clever with the writing. I just write as I think. I think if you try and be too sort of clever and embellish stuff too much, you lose the essence of what it originally was. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, you try, it's like anything, you try and make it too good. You, yeah. chip away, you chip away from the good stuff that was there. Well, you had a good ship to write about. Tell me a little bit about the QE2. She was the first ship I ever went on. So what was it like for you? The Queen Elizabeth II was like putting to sea in the Ritz. It's as simple as that. Well, putting to sea in what I imagined the Ritz would be like. But she had that history, she had that whole heritage, you know, the Cunard line going back 140 years as it was at the time. You know, she was solid, she was dependable. <laughs> she was quirky. She was a very quirky old girl, the QE. You never quite knew what she was going to do next in a storm. <laughs> but she had just so much soul and heart and character that you would have to have been a Dalek not to fall in love with that ship. Mm, mm. You know, even the Daleks would have taken to her. No. She was just something else. How, how has cruising evolved for you over those last 35 years? Because it's changed dramatically. Oh, hugely. It's evolved in terms of dining options. It's evolved in terms of, you know, restaurant choices, mm -hmm. uh, bars, entertainment. The entertainment has come on in leaps and bounds. Cabins are another area where it's changed massively. I mean, They're when I state rooms now. <laughs> yeah, when I first started, the average inside cabin was about the size of a pygmy's postage stamp. You know, they were about that big, and I used to feel really, really privileged to have one of those. You know, those little wooden cabins with the wooden walls and all the rest. And then I got sort of bumped up into the twenty-first century, as it were, and. The balconies came out and the separate mm -hmm. dining areas and the padded lounges out on the balcony and the bathrooms with all the nice, you know, the mm -hmm. nice amenities, mm -hmm. like the Elemis stuff and all that. Yeah. And the big thick bathrobes that you could just spend a week in if you could get away with it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's evolved in a lot of ways, but it's paradoxical at the same time because while a lot has changed, so much hasn't. And it's the natural stuff. It's just like the sound of the sea against a ship's side at night. Mm. You know, that's perennial. Yes. You know, that just keeps going on. Uh, sunsets, they still get me. Yeah. Doesn't matter where I am in a world, I will stand transfixed like a five-year-old kid and watch sunsets until they're done. Yeah, they're the things that don't change. What about the difference in, you spoke earlier about the dining. What mm. about the difference in dining options? I'm a great fan of more freestyle dining. Yes. Rather than just 6.30, 8.30 and you're sitting at your same table. Mm. I like that it's more fluid now. Do you? Yeah, there's a lot of great advantages. I mean, especially if you've had a really, really long day ashore somewhere. Or if you're in an overnight port of call and you might want to get out later on, go see a show. Mm. You know, have or a few eat drinks. locally. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. Of course, exactly. I mean, that's one of the things I personally love to do, especially you know somewhere like Turkey, or the coast of Italy. You know, the Neapolitan Riviera. That's absolutely brilliant. Being able to have the option of eating ashore, but as far as flexible dining on the ship itself is concerned, you know, there's nothing better than being able to go and grab a burger at five o'clock. If you want to do that, yeah. maybe 
have a couple of desserts from the buffet. And then if you want to grab a pizza, go and grab a pizza. <laughs> you can do it. You can do it 24 seven. Stay with me, Anthony, don't go anywhere. We've got so much more to talk about and please don't go anywhere because we'll be right back after this quick break. <laughs> Welcome back to the Blogger's Guide to Cruising and Anthony Nicholas is still with me. Anthony, you and I met uh, on the vo cruise line Voyages to Antiquity. We had a great we time. Did, we Myanmar, did, we did, yes. Myanmar, and we had a great laugh. You have, though, been on just about every ship going. As I said in my introduction, you know, big, small, intimate, mega. Do you have a preference for a kind of, of ship? It depends where I'm going, really, Julie, to be honest. If you're going to do a cruise with a lot of sea days or an Atlantic crossing, I tend to go for a larger ship mm -hmm. with more amenities and more entertainment and more diversions. If I really want to see somewhere in depth, like the little yacht harbours in the Mediterranean and the Greek islands, I'll typically try and go for a smaller ship. Okay. Yeah. Favourite destinations? You must have so many, oh, but Lord. ones that make your heart oh. sing. Bermuda, immediately, straight Bermuda. away, Bermuda. Really? Bermuda. Tell me why, I'm going to be dead straight with you, because I, I went to Bermuda, went with the Travel Channel on Norwegian Epic, mm. and it was lovely, but it didn't make my heart sing. What's it do for you? For me, it's, there's just something really deliciously unreal about it, and <laughs> it's out there on its own. It's 600 miles from the nearest land. You know, it's not like when you go down to the Caribbean and those islands, they're all within sort of hopping distance mm -hmm. and they're very developed and there's a lot of hawkers and all that kind of thing going on. I mean, Bermuda, it's what it hasn't got. There are no traffic jams. I mean, a traffic jam on Bermuda used to be two more beds and a golf cart <laughs> the first time I ever went there. There were no fast food restaurants, which to me, you know, being sort of in my Victor Melru dotage is absolutely spot on. I love anything like that. The beaches, you can stroll them. They're all pink coral sand. You can stroll a beach and literally see nobody else. The speed limit is 20 mile an hour. The pace of life, it, it's just dreamy. It's just so dreamy. It's idyllic. It's laid back. The people are polite. You know, they are legendary for their courtesy. And the place just has just such an unreal feel-good vibe. And for me, it's kind of magnetic. It, it, it draws you back. Right. It's just got this irresistible pull that, you know, you get somewhere or you don't. And I think Bermuda gets me like that. Right, yes, that's very good. You either get it or you don't. Mm. Are there other places that, that you get that you'd like to share with us? Maybe mm. places off the beaten track that people might not know about as a destination? In the south of France, there's a small French fishing village called Villefranche-sur-Mer. Villefranche-sur-Mer. Which is where most of the big ships anchor. Uh -huh. And they tender their passengers in ashore and the passengers look at it. They look at Villefranche, you see their jaws drop. They hit the top of their shoes, the sheer beauty of the place. I mean, it's been used as a backdrop in at least two Bond movies that I know of. Really? But then they get ashore and they shoot straight through. They go to Nice, they go to Cannes, they go to Monte Carlo. You know, Villefranche is just a stopping point. It's just a staging post. For me, it's somewhere just to wallow in. Right. You know, the three hour lunch on the waterfront. Yes. Little glass of pasties, whatever. And you just chill. How important do you think shore excursions are? Because that sounds to me like a day where you don't go on an excursion. It sounds like That's you right. just think, I know Villefranche, I don't need to go Nice, Canada, I'm yeah. going to stay put. Do, do you think there's a case for where would you do a shore excursion, where would you not? Presumably, somewhere, obviously for somewhere like Rome, I would yeah. definitely do a shore excursion uh -huh. because it's an hour and a half inland from where the ships actually dock. And while it's relatively compact, Rome is also very, very crowded in the summer. Mm -hmm. And if you want to get a comprehensive look at the city in a very short space of time, then I, I do think the best thing to do 
is a shore excursion from the ship. Very good. It'll give you the maximum amount of time that you can get. It will show you more than you could probably see for yourself yeah. on any realistic timetable. So for cities like Rome, I would do definitely, I would do a tour in Rome. Mm -hmm. The big cities in South America, like Rio de Janeiro, I would initially at least do a ship's tour there to get an orientation of the place. Because even though the tours only really give you snapshots, a snapshot can stay with you and you can think, wow, I want to go back there later. Absolutely. I, and and I also, if, if a place is really big or maybe a little edgy or maybe the language you, you're, you're not familiar with, at least you're, you've are you got the safety of the ship and the safety of knowing you're going to get back on time as well. Yeah, that's a big thing. Mm. If you're in a city and for the first time and you don't know how things are going to work out vis-a-vis -vis traffic jams, yep. you know, congestion, whether there's a public holiday or something. Yeah. Whether there's some kind of celebration that might impact sort of getting there and back. If you don't know all those things, then, you know, err on the side of caution. Definitely. Take the ships to her, do the safe thing, get in, see the must-see, what I call the greatest hit sites. Take them off, take them out of your bucket list, and then if you need a bigger bucket, go back later and <laughs> see them under your own steam. Anthony, cruising, as we both know, has grown in popularity massively, certainly over the last decade, 15 mm, years. Sure. Is there anything directly that you attribute that to? Sheer value for money, exclusivity, inclusivity, much, much more awareness. Definitely the rise of blogging has had a huge amount to do with it, but that's gone hand in hand actually with the expansion of the industry uh -huh. the one has fed off the other really you know they've given each other sort of food for thought and they built it's been symbiotic sort right. of blogging and the rise of cruising the internet has got a huge amount to do with it as well you know there's much more awareness certainly of what is out there than when i first started cruising you know there's a huge amount more now mm. information's easily accessible Online forums like yes. Cruise Critic and you Cruise can Critic, exactly. do your research. Yeah. The fact that these ships as well now, especially the big mega ships, are so much more family friendly and receptive to, you know, really groups of all ages. Yeah. You know, I, I hear people telling me that they've had, you know, family groups going where they've had people ranging from, say, three to 80 <laughs> in a big combined family group of 15 or 16 people. Wow. And the thing is that they've all gone and they've all had a marvellous time. You know, that points up the sheer diversity of mm. this industry these days. You know, that a line, that one product can take such a diverse range and put something out there for all of them. And they're all gonna come back and go, wow. Yeah, fantastic. You know, yeah, I think that's great. You mentioned value for money. Now, mm. some people don't think, some people still think cruising, oh no, no, that's high end, that's a luxury holiday, we, could, we couldn't go there. What would you say to that? A misconception? Because it's not, is it? You can get some fantastic value cruises. You can get some really, really fantastic value cruises. You can do two and three and four day cruises if you want to try for the first time. If you want to get... taster. Yeah, if you want to get your feet wet, to use like a really, really bad pun. Without breaking the bank, you can go and do that. You can go and do that. It's relatively cheap. It's cheerful. It's painless. Yeah. The bank manager is not going to be offering you a loaded revolver when you come back. You go and you get a taste for it. And there's so much included as well. You know. Well, this is, this is where I come back to the inclusivity. Yes. If you stack what is included on a typical cruise, and I'm talking sort of budget, mainstream, high-end, whatever, and you try and put that into a conventional land-based package, you wouldn't get anything like the value on the land-based package. I guarantee that. Mm. I agree with you, absolutely. You would not get anything like the value, nor, in all honesty, would you get the quality. And you'd have to unpack a lot more times. You and, know? You don't, and at the end of the day, if you've had a good night out on the town on a cruise ship, and that's exactly what these modern cruise ships are, they are small towns. Mm. If you've had a really good night out, you've had a good dinner, you've seen a good show, you've been partying, you've been discoing or whatever, little small hours, you don't have to get a taxi home. No, somebody else is, you can have a drink because somebody else is doing the driving. Somebody else does the driving. <laughs> somebody else is actually up there taking care of the park and they know where the best parking spots are. You don't have to worry about yep. it. 
All you've got to do is sort of roll up at a time that suits you. Go and have your three hour lunch in Sorrento if that's what you want to do. Or go to the Parthenon or Schwedagon. Yeah. Come back. The beds are made. Dinner's cooking. There's a chocolate on your pillow. There's a chocolate on your pillow. <laughs> ah, not on all the lines now, though. Oh, really? There's not a... on all of the no? lines. Oh, OK, don't. The, cho the chocolates are beginning to melt into the background, so oh, to speak. Oh, no, never the day. I know, I know. <laughs> I know. Anything still on your bucket list? Oh, wow. I'm going to need a bigger bucket. That's really? all I can tell you. Ah, South Africa. Uh-huh. I would love to do the old Cape run from right. Southampton down to South Africa. It's a bit sort of Mrs. Marple kind of thing, you know, a bit murder on the Orient Express no in there for that. good measure. No, no, no. And the older I get, the dottier I get, I look at these things and think, ooh, that might be fun. Yeah. So that, um, but what really has got me sort of buzzing at the moment is the planned revival of the SS United States by Crystal Cruises. Aha. Uh -huh. Now Very that good. is gonna be something else if it comes off. Yeah, you're going to be on there, aren't you, on its inaugural voyage? Well, when I first started cruising in 1981, there were three big ocean liners that I'd really wanted to go on. The Norway, the Queen Elizabeth II, and the United States. I've done the Norway, I've done the QE2. It's got to happen. And against all the odds, and nobody would have bet on it ever happening. It looks like the United States is coming back <laughs> as well. So, Edie Rodriguez, if you're watching. <laughs> oh. Yep, I'd love to do that. Fantastic, I hope you do. Final, final question, Anthony. Any tips for aspiring travel writers, cruise bloggers, any nutshells for people watching that they can take away with? Any nuggets, nutshells? Read, absorb, learn, study other bloggers, but don't try and write like them. Don't try and write like anybody else but yourself. If you're good enough, it will work in time. Don't think it's gonna happen overnight, it won't. It doesn't work like that. But if you're good enough and you're determined enough and you stick with it, you'll get the results. Fantastic. And at the end of the day, the bottom line, you owe it to yourself to try. You got that bee in your bonnet, give it a go. Fantastic. Thank you, Anthony. What a thank great you. guest. Thank you so much. And thank you too for watching. I'll see you next time with another edition of the Blogger's Guide to Cruising. Bye for now. Ooh.